15 minutes, and the appellant may reserve up to five minutes. You ready to proceed? Yes, sure. May it please the court, my name is Scott Essig for the Jackson Milton Local School District, and I would like to reserve three minutes Thank for rebuttal. There are many different arguments that we've made in our brief. There's only one assignment of error, but essentially they all come down to this. The juvenile court had three chances to do, to provide due process to Jackson Milton, and did not do that on all three of those occasions. The first was when the case first came to the court, and the mother's address was listed as unknown, the placement of the minor was made, and the court did whatever it was going to do. Eventually, when the mother came to the court and gave this fake address, and I think we can all agree that it's a non-existent fake address, the court issued its order and did not provide any notice or any way for Jackson Milton to know what was occurring. Now, Jackson Milton didn't know what was occurring until much later because the child was placed long before she actually went to school. I suspect that, and I tried to do the math, and I don't know, I have a daughter, but it was either kindergarten or first grade when she would have tried to be enrolled. The treasurer of Cuyahoga Falls rightly said, well, you know, before we enroll her, we're going to have to go, we're going to have to do whatever. She had already been living with the parents, or the grandparents at that point, and that's fine, and they were doing a good thing. But when the court identified Jackson Milton, the court didn't do anything. And there was no appeal of that? Jackson Milton had no notice. I'm just saying, whether it was justified or not, there was no appeal of that. Yes, correct. The second was much later, when the child was enrolled in school, and Cuyahoga Falls wrote its letter, and there's nothing wrong with Cuyahoga Falls writing that letter, saying, hey, it's Jackson Milton, perhaps you should identify. So Jackson Milton was identified, Jackson Milton filed its motion, and the court said, well, I think maybe we did make a mistake here, and it doesn't appear that it is an appropriate address, but we're not going to do it, go to the Department of Education. And then the third time... And there was no appeal from that? No, the court's order was followed. The court said go to the Department of Education. Right, but you could have appealed and said that's wrong. I don't have to go to the Department of Education. I'm not sure about that, Judge Carr. I'm not sure that we could have appealed that. The court, to this day, the juvenile court, that is, is sticking by its decision in Henry Humrich that we don't have any jurisdiction, the proper outlet, which Cuyahoga Falls has argued, too, is the Department of Education, that's where we go, so that's where we went. I don't know that it was a situation where, you know, Judge, you've told us to go to the Department of Education, and that's just wrong. Your order is wrong, so we're going to go to the Court of Appeals. I don't think that was that situation. The third time, of course, was when the Department of Education said this isn't us, this isn't our thing, and then the juvenile court said, you know, the court made the appropriate determination. 135 Market Street is in the Jackson Milton School District, and that's the way it's going to stay. And then writes Henry Humrich, we don't have any further jurisdiction. That, of course, was the third decision that brought about this appeal. And that was the decision that, that was the decision that actually put, for the first time, facts into evidence, saying it is Jackson Milton, 135 Market Street is in the Jackson Milton School District, Jackson Milton bears the cost of educating this minor. But even that decision, as I understand it, was not directly appealed, but rather, I believe my notes indicate that Jackson Milton filed a motion, a 60B motion, in the court. That motion, I believe, Your Honor, was appealed. 
that order came out saying it is Jackson Miller. And that was on November 5th, 2015. And then this appeal was made, I want to say December 5th, 2015. But, yeah, but, but maybe I don't need to speak for Judge Moore, but I think what she's referring to is how did you get back in front of the court? Didn't you file a motion to vacate? Once the Department of Education turned you down, then you went back to the juvenile court with a motion. Well, there was no Rule 60 motion. Um, well, what did well, you file? It, it was a motion to intervene. intervene. Um, the reason why it was a motion to intervene is because there's an order that affects Jackson Milton that is going to require Jackson Milton to pay for this child until she's at least 18 and possibly 21. Depending. I thought the motion to intervene was in the prior case. That, that, was, that was both. There, there was no, it was not a, a rule. So you filed a motion to intervene once, it was denied, and you didn't appeal that. Just follow me. Yes. And then you filed another motion to intervene the second time, and you appealed it the second time. Correct. And here's why. It looks like the court's order here, from which you've appealed, November 5th, 2015, says this cause came before the court upon the request of Jackson Milton Local School District to amend or vacate this court's orders regarding financial responsibility for educating the child. Correct. I, I'm not calling that, and I realize that there's different ways to get to the same place. Uh, there's a directed verdict, for instance, in a trial. There's also a Rule 52 motion. Uh, but uh, we never actually called that a rule. And, and I understand that, and I am sure the court, that all of us do, but I guess the problem with that is we can't just call things whatever we want to to get out of the um, consequences of, like, a 60B. We can't. The law says you, you look at what the purpose is, not what you call it. I don't disagree with that. Um, I don't disagree with that. The way I look at it is this. This court always has, when I say this court, I don't mean this appellate court. <laughs> I mean the juvenile court. That court always has jurisdiction over the minor until she's 18 or 21, depending on, on her status and if there's um, an IEP and whatnot. So the court is always going to have jurisdiction there. It's the court, um, as set forth in, in the NRA DH case, that says it's the juvenile court that has responsibility to name the appropriate school district. The juvenile court, the first time, named a school district. We filed that motion. The court said, go to the Department of Education. And I don't want to rehash, but we did what the court told us to do. I don't believe that that was error. I don't believe that that was error on the trial court to say, go to the Department of Education. When the Department of Education demurred, then we went back, and that's what brings about this case. What makes that second order different is, at that point, the court said, you know what? I'm taking back what I might have originally said, that maybe there was an error, maybe there was an error, maybe it's not Jackson Milton. It is Jackson Milton. And, and it's from that decision that, um, again, no hearings, no evidence, no ability to brief, no anything. Okay. Let me just make sure I understand, too. When the Department of Education turned you down, you didn't file an any type of administrative appeal either. Correct. Correct. What the Department of Education said, and, and this is, you know, it's, the Department of Education is not a broom for the juvenile courts. It doesn't clean up after the juvenile court. The scheme for, for what, the, what was being asked is, if a parent properly is, let's say that it was Jackson Milton, and there's no question about it that it's Jackson Milton, and now the child is eight, nine, 10 years old, and now the child moves to Wadsworth, you can go to the Department of Education and say, you know, it's Wadsworth. It used to be Jackson Milton, but now it's Wadsworth. Here's the mother's address. Here's her electric bill. Here's, here's all that sort of thing. It's Wadsworth. Um, so it wasn't an appropriate administrative appeal from the Department of Education. It was an appropriate appeal from the court's November order. The reason why is because 
Jackson Malou did what the court asked. That did not work out. But if, if, did, did you, in your motion, ask the juvenile court to vacate its order? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, we did. And, and, so and the order we asked to vacate was not the original order. It was the order saying, um, perhaps there's error, uh, perhaps it, it might not be Jackson Milton, perhaps you should go to the Department of Education. Because well, that, that wasn't the court's order, if I understood it. That was the magistrate. The magistrate is the one who equivocated about. The magistrate equivocated, and on the same day, that was, I want to say, September 30th, 2014, and on the same day, the court adopted the magistrate's decision. Um, so she adopted it in full. Um, so it's, I, I say that it's the court adopting that magistrate's decision, saying perhaps it's not Jackson Milton. And in fact, it was the court in its order. Now, the court did not use the same language. Counsel, I'm going to just uh, caution you that you are in rebuttal time. It's up to you. If you want to continue, that's fine. Unless you have any questions, um, I'll sit down and reserve the rest of my time Thank for rebuttal. You. Here's where this parent actually lives. 
And you know, this is a statute that I think deals with a difficult situation, which is transient parents. And it's, it's a reality, and this is how the legislature chose to deal with it, which is that when a school district feels that the juvenile court's decision was not correct, they have the ability to go to the Ohio Department of Education, the Ohio Department of Education can sort it out. Uh, there is no right under the statute for the school district to continue to argue before the juvenile court that it deserves more than that. And that's supported by a case I did in the brief, which is in Ray AK, which is a uh, case that's similar to the present case in which the board of the local school district in that case also filed a motion to intervene and to amend or vacate the school district's order. That case was before the 7th District Court of Appeals. And the 7th District said, you don't have this right. There's nothing under the statute that gives you this right. The juvenile court applies the statute based on the information they have, and your input is not required. The people who should be parties to this action are the people who are interested in the best interests of a child, and your interest is a solely financial one. Uh, so the 7th District Court of Appeals has very clearly said that what Jackson Milton is asking for today is not under the statute, uh, and that they are not entitled to that right, and they're not entitled to place that additional burden upon the juvenile court to continue, continue to go through these proceedings, particularly a year after the juvenile court already made a decision uh, that the Ohio Department of Education was the correct forum. So the when the Ohio Department of Education turned them down, what were they supposed to do? They can appeal that decision under Chapter 119. Uh, and so you're saying the Ohio Department of Education messed up? If, if they have evidence that the uh, parent has not acted within Lake Millton or the Jackson Milton School District, which I don't believe has been established anywhere in the record. Well, is that what the Department of Education determined? I thought they said that basically they didn't have jurisdiction either. With the, uh, and I'm basing this on an email that Jackson Milton attached to their October 23rd, 2015 motion is the only information I have about that matter. Otherwise, it's not part of the record. But what that email basically says is you're required to give us proof of where this parent resides. We don't have the ability to say, juvenile court, you messed up, you need to redo this. What we have the ability to do is change it and correct it based on new information. So that's what Jackson Milton was required to do. Uh, and the Ohio Department of Education said that's, that's not what he did. I'm not certain exactly what they presented, but that was the Ohio Department of Education's response. And is that a function of the fact that in the normal course, these come to the Department of Education when a parent changes school district residence? In other words, is it a function of revisiting what the proper school district is now based on where the parent lives now, not of revisiting whether a correct determination was made at the get go? As far as the Department of Education goes. The Ohio Department of Education, and I believe the email indicates this, is basically these are parents that who move often. So uh, at any point in time when you determine that the parent is no longer in your school district, for whatever reason that might be, you have the ability as a school district to present that information to the Ohio Department of Education. And actually the guidelines for the Ohio Department of Education for that process, which are not in the record, they are available on the website, um, require school districts to go within a relatively short time frame, something like 60 days, because of that concern that these are parents who may or may not be in the same place very long. Um, right, but mm -hmm. it kind of goes to my colleague's question about was it really just a, an email whatever we have in the record don't have, that said we don't have the ability to do what you're asking us to do, which is essentially not change the location because the parent moved, but change the court order on the first determination of the parent's location. I think that it was just. Uh, that's the way the legislature set this up. And they actually changed the statute in 2007 to remove the juvenile court's continued uh, participation in this. They, they want the Ohio Department of Education to sort things, these things out. So in other words, you're saying you appeal basically the juvenile court's decision to the Department of Education? You go through that the seems like there might be a little problem of separation of powers there. It's not truly an appeal. It's going to the Ohio Department of Education saying this is not correct. Yeah. The Ohio Department of Education was correct in that they can't order the juvenile court to do anything. So it's not an appeal in that sense. But they do have the ability to look at the evidence and to say, okay, based on what we have right now, we now have timely documents within the last 60 days. It's clear this parent lives someplace else. So now this other school district is responsible for the educational cost of the child. From that point forward? Correct. But Although not? If they, if, uh, I believe under the guidelines on the website, if you are able to find evidence that does backdate, that shows back from the earlier date, and you had filed that form prior to that date, they can backdate it. But if you're not able to, do, if you did not challenge it earlier, and if you don't provide evidence to that date, then it would be uh, going prospectively. Furthermore, the 
larger issue in this case is that the uh, Jackson Milton did not timely appeal this issue. Uh, it came to Jackson Milton's attention, we know, at the latest in September of 2014. Well, isn't it an issue of time? I don't mean to be nitpicky, but I have to do that as an appellate judge because we determine our jurisdiction. So you're not you're not contesting that this latest order from November. I'm not sure I have to pull it up. November 5th was timely appealed. I don't contest that it was timely appealed from the October motion. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're contesting is whether the October mo motion is something that should have happened or could be appealed in the first place, uh, because it's basically the same motion that was filed. So it's kind of like a res judicata type thing. Correct. And really, what what Jackson Milton is attempting to do is to have another bite of the apple. Uh, after that September 14 motion was unsuccessful. And uh, that motion uh, was in September 30, 2014, where the juvenile court denied it. And you could compare the September 14 motion with the October 23, 2015 motion. They're very similar. The basic arguments between the two are essentially the same, that Jackson Milton disputes the validity of the evidence that the uh, juvenile court relied upon in making a determination of that. Based on that, wants further hearings before the juvenile and the juvenile court already made a decision in September 30th, 2014. To come back a year later undermines the finality of the decision of the juvenile court and really uh, of any decision across the state. People then have the ability, the parties have the ability to go someplace else, see if they can get the result that they want, and when they don't, come back to the original venue and present the same arguments, perhaps in a slightly different way, uh, and then claim, oh, now we get to appeal this because your response was in some facet slightly different than the response you already made on these very same issues. Uh, so based on that, this appeal uh, should be dismissed on that basis alone. But you know, going to the merits, the statute sets forth very clearly the procedure that needs to be followed, which is that the juvenile court makes the decision initially and then it goes to the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, and the case that Jackson Milton relies upon in their briefs after IT, I think it's important to note, was decided under an earlier version of the statute. That case is from 2005, and the statute was revised significantly in 2007. Uh, it's also from the Sixth District, Sixth District Court of Appeals. So for purposes of this hearing, I think it's questionable uh, what value that holds for this court. Uh, furthermore, the facts in that case are very different from the facts that we have here. Uh, in that case, the child was living with the grandparents. However, the mother lived in Missouri, and it's clear from the facts of that case that the whereabouts of the father were unknown. So based on those circumstances, the court determined that the school district where the child lived was responsible for the educational costs because it was not known where the father was, and the mother was outside the court's jurisdiction and also at some point during the proceedings passed away. That's not what we have here. Uh, and Jackson Milton, based on that case, now is claiming for the first time in this appeal that Coyote Falls should be responsible for the cost of educating this child. Uh, this is not an argument that's appropriate to be making for the first time on appeal, and furthermore, this is a very different situation than those situations where the court has no idea where the parents are and is left with no other option than to assign educational costs based on where the child is located. These parents were both involved during the proceedings, uh, the mother and the father, both appeared at one point or another. Uh, the father was incarcerated at one point in time, and the mother did not appear for, I believe, one of the hearings. But they both were involved earlier in the proceedings. Uh, so they are known to the court, and they were known at the time that the court made its decision in this matter, uh, regardless of whether or not Jackson Milton agrees with the validity of that decision. <coughs> if there are no further questions, I will briefly conclude. I think that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Based on the foregoing, the Fall City School District Board of Education, I respectfully request that this court dismiss the appeal as untimely. In the alternative, should this court consider the merits of the action, uh, this court should affirm the decision of the juvenile court because the juvenile court did not abuse its discretion when it applied Ohio Revised Code 2151.362. Thank you, Your Honor. juvenile court did not make the argument that, oh, this second motion, this Rule 60 motion, this motion of amendment, whatever you want to call it, the juvenile court did not make any kind of finding about it. it's late, it's untimely, it's inappropriate jurisdiction, I, don't, I, the court, don't have jurisdiction. None of that was brought up by the juvenile court. The juvenile court addressed
address the issue head on. And the juvenile court said, I've looked at this, 135 Market Street is the appropriate address, Jackson Milton pays. None of those other arguments were made. And Cuyahoga Falls was copied with all of those things and briefed it at the time. None of those arguments were made either when we talk about first argued on appeal. So, um, if this issue relates to the jurisdiction of this court to hear the appeal, we look at it sui sponte, right? I think, Judge Moore, that when the trial court's decision is titled order, and it makes certain statements of fact, and the appeal is made within 30 days, I think you look at that order and whether it was correct or whether it was an error. And I think you would review it, to use another Latin term, de novo, but I don't think you need to sui sponte raise the issue of perhaps the juvenile court shouldn't have raised that issue at all. No one has argued that either. The, the juvenile court, as I said, addressed it head on, appropriately so. The other thing that I want to address is, th this is not a case of, if that's answered your question, the other thing is, this is not a case of transient parents. This isn't a case where one parent moves and they move around, and, and that happens all the time. This is a case where the initial order was wrong, and the court even admitted that the initial order was wrong. Now, we haven't argued, we haven't, the, the relief we've requested hasn't been make Cuyahoga Falls pay. I do think, and it's fair to say, that that may come, depending on what, if you grant us a favorable decision here, we're not asking that of you. The point is, it's been wrong from the start. There was a complaint, which, which Jackson Milton was never privy to, was not allowed to see, but the complaint said the mother's address was unknown, and that's the date the child was removed. At the time the child was removed, the mother's address being unknown, the father, by the way, being in Akron, the appropriate determination should have been Cuyahoga Falls. I think, if you don't mind, yes. um, you said that the court has continuing jurisdiction to look at this issue. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, well, again, uh, the Supreme Court said it in, in Ray Cross, and um, in Adoption Link versus uh, Subaru, which were cited in our brief, that, that the courts have said that the juvenile court has exclusive subject matter that cannot be waived. Um, it has the exclusive and continuing jurisdiction over the mind. Um, and it's, oh, it's talking about just in general. Yes, just in general. Okay. As far as this issue, though, again, you, you, you said it, Judge Clark. There, there's not, I don't think there's a common pleas judge in this state that would accept an administrative agency saying, you know, you got it wrong. Uh, you, you, you ruled on eminent domain. There was an eminent domain trial. And the judge ruled that, you know, this road can go through some neighborhood somewhere. And then the, the, some department at the, at, in Ohio says, you know, we're not going to put the road where the judge said we're going to put it. We're going to put it somewhere else. Uh, or, I, that's off the top of my head. I wish I could think of a better example. But the Zechariah case, though, it, when we talk about, well, the 7th District did this, you know, in this case, it, it, it's extremely close and tracks what happened here. Number one. Well, Counselor, you're out of time. Thank you, Your Honor.